Lots of new discoveries are made each year across every scientific discipline. These range from vaguely interesting curiosities to absolutely mind-blowing feats of scientific ingenuity. From fully functional simulated brains to reversibly transparent mice, today we're going to be looking at some of the biggest scientific discoveries of the past year. Despite being the subject of endless research, the brain remains the most poorly understood organ in the human body due to the fact that it's really complicated. However, a massive development may pave the way forward for future research in understanding exactly how our brains work. That development was a complete map of an adult fruit fly brain published in a package of nine related papers in the journal Nature last October. These maps are also known as connectomes, and this is only the third connectome ever completed. The first one, mapping the brain of a nematode, was completed in 1986 after over a decade of work. The adult nematode brain contains only 302 neurons and 7,000 synapses, the connections between the different neurons. The next connectome completed was in 2023 and was of the same species of fruit fly as the latest achievements, but in its larval stage. The larval fruit fly contains 3,106 neurons and 548,000 synapses. This was another impressive achievement, but it pales in comparison to what was published this Year. Adult fruit fly brains are about the size of a grain of sand, yet they contain 140,000 neurons and over 53 million synapses, making this connectome the largest undertaking of this type by multiple orders of magnitude. In order to create this model, researchers began by cutting the brain into 7,000 slices, each only 40 nanometers thick. An electron microscope was then used to compile 21 million images of the brain, totaling roughly 100 terabytes of data. It's a similar process to what was done with the nematode brain, just on a much larger scale. But even the original project took over a decade, so trying to turn the millions of images into a detailed map of the brain could have taken lifetimes. But to speed up the process, AI was used to assemble all of these images into a 3D model of the brain. AI is prone to making mistakes, though, so the entire model had to be checked for errors. This effort was led by Flywire Consortium, who made the decision to make everything publicly available. By doing so, not only were there hundreds of dedicated researchers from labs around the world proofing the connectome, but volunteers were able to take part in the effort as well. Whereas it's estimated that it would have taken a single person 33 years to check the AI's work, Flywire's team effort was able to accomplish it in just a few years. Today's video brought to you by the legends over at Surfshark. Look, your online data is wide open. Every time you're browsing, shopping, streaming, companies and hackers, even your ISP, they're tracking you, which is an unpleasant thought. But, well, good news, that's where Surfshark VPN comes in. Surfshark encrypts your internet connection, keeping your data private and secure. That means no more tracking, no more targeted ads, no more region-locked content. If you want to watch something that's not available on, say, Netflix or whatever your streaming service is in your country, just hop onto Surfshark. Choose up. I'm often going on there, it's like, oh yeah, America. America's got a massive Netflix library compared to Europe. So you connect to America and you're like, look at all these other shows. And then even if you're American, sometimes you'll be on Netflix and you'll be like, why don't they have this? I found out they, I, it, I can't remember which way round it was, but I couldn't get any of the Mission Impossible movies. And so I used Surfshark to jump onto US uh, Netflix and it was like, oh look, all of the Mission Impossible movies. That's nice. Now I don't have to pay for them, like through Apple TV or whatever. So look, you can protect your privacy, you can get more streaming options, and it's all done with the fantastic people over at Surfshark. And right now they've got a great deal. Sign up and you get four extra months for free. All you need to do is go to surfshark.com slash side projects to get this offer. That's surfshark.com slash side projects. Stay private online with Surfshark. And now back to today's video. Having a detailed and complete map of the brain is vital for helping us understand exactly how it works. As soon as the nematode connectome was completed, all future research was miles ahead of anything that had happened before it, and the same is expected to happen here. More importantly, as we build these maps for more and more complex brains, they will become even more relevant in how we understand the human brain. And there may be less of a wait between new brains being modeled thanks to the innovative approach taken by Flywire. The combination of AI and crowdsourcing massively sped up the timeline for this project, and such an approach could be used to accelerate future endeavors. But perhaps the most intriguing development from all of this is that a team of researchers used the publicly available connectome to make a computer simulation of the fly's brain. 
and it worked. The simulated brain can be given different stimuli, and it has been an extremely good predictor of the neural activity that occurs in an actual fly brain given that same stimuli. The researchers believe that the same sort of simulation should be possible with a larger brain as well, and if such a simulation produces the same level of accuracy, then a connectome of even a mouse brain could prove invaluable in understanding how our own brains function. The first cases of AIDS were reported back in 1981, with HIV being identified as the cause of the disease a couple of years later in 1983. The early years of the AIDS epidemic were defined by fear, as nobody knew what the disease was or how it was transmitted. Doctors treating patients feared for their lives, unsure whether or not they too would contract the deadly disease. Even after the HIV virus was identified, it was another two years before a blood antibody test was developed that could determine whether or not a person had been infected with HIV. Once a person was infected, even though the virus would remain dormant for years before they developed AIDS, it was considered a death sentence. Now that changed in 1996 when the first antiviral treatment for HIV was developed to prevent it from progressing to AIDS. Research from 2011 then showed the drugs used in the treatment of HIV could be effective at preventing further transmission. Known as pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, these daily oral pills virtually eliminated new cases of HIV infection among their users. Unfortunately, new infections have far from been eliminated as the use of PrEP has not been widespread. It is predominantly used by those in high-risk communities, and its efficacy is also lessened by people not taking the pills daily either due to forgetfulness or changes in their social habits that make them feel like it's less necessary. Cost has also been a factor, as name-brand prescriptions can cost up to $2,000 per month. But this is all still a far cry from an HIV vaccine, which would be the ultimate preventative measure. In 2021, a new form of PrEP was created that was given intravenously rather than as oral medication. Patients needed a new shot every two months, but it was still a big step forward. In 2024, however, an even bigger step towards a possible vaccine was made. Lenacapavir, manufactured by Gilnead Sciences under the name Sunlicker, has already been in use since 2022 and as a treatment for HIV patients who had shown resistance to other forms of treatment. Other HIV antivirals target enzymes used in virus reproduction, but Lenacapavir targets the virus's capsid, a protein shell surrounding the virus. The drug causes this shell to harden, which interferes with its ability to enter a cell nucleus and replicate. Research for use of this drug as a form of PrEP was published in 2024, and the results were astounding. The first trial was conducted on women in Uganda and South Africa, and Lenacapavir had a 100% efficacy rate of preventing new HIV infections. Of the over 5,000 women in the study, not a single one contracted HIV. There were obviously some doubts about the results, so another trial was performed. The next trial used a more diverse set of test subjects, with the thousands of patients in the trial spread across four continents. This trial also reported a 99.9% .9 efficacy with only two new infections among the thousands of participants. Not only is this more effective than existing injections, though those also boast higher than 99% efficacy, but one injection of Lencapavir lasts for at least six months rather than only two. Further trials have taken place to see if a single injection can give a person protection from HIV for a full year. A twice yearly injection is still less ideal than a true vaccine, but this is an incredible step towards the end goal. Unfortunately, there's still the matter of price. Sunlenka has a retail price of $42,250 per year. However, research published from those outside Gilnead Sciences shows that this number could be brought down dramatically. The study concluded that if mass-produced, a generic version of the drug would still be profitable at an annual price of only $40 per year, provided that at least 10 million people were using it. Not only is this a major step forward in fighting HIV, but the method of targeting a virus as capsid is still relatively novel. The success of this drug shows that this newer approach may give scientists a way to combat other viruses in the future. If you're unfamiliar with LiDAR, it is basically the same thing as radar, except it uses light rather than radio waves. LiDAR is generally far more accurate than radar, but there are still some disadvantages. The equipment is much more expensive, and it generally has a much shorter range than radar. Because it uses light in the form of lasers, it's also much more vulnerable to interference, both from other light sources and from atmospheric conditions, specifically moisture. 
That said, LiDAR is still a popular tool among scientists, such as ecologists who want to map vegetation, carbon stocks, erosion, and more. In 2013, a group of ecologists used LiDAR to map the biomass in Mexican forests and monitor it for environmental purposes. Their survey of the land was published in 2014, and for a decade, it sat available online, largely ignored. Fast forward to 2024, and Tulane University PhD student Luke or Thomas was browsing Google looking for LiDAR surveys. Some of his colleagues had found a LiDAR survey done by NASA, also focused on environmental research, and they saw how the data could be repurposed for archaeological purposes. Luke kept scrolling through the search results until he was on something like page 16 of Google search, at which point he found the long-forgotten Mexican environmental survey. With the help of a colleague from the University of Houston who specialized in algorithms designed to remove the tree cover from the data to see what was hiding below, it was discovered that the site had actually been home to a large Mayan city. There were over 6,700 buildings of various sizes, including pyramids, plazas, a ball court, and a reservoir. The architecture suggests that the city was originally built before 150 AD and that the population would have peaked sometime in the 8th or 9th century, with between 30 and 50,000 people living there, more than the number of people who live there today. Luke and his colleagues named the city Valeriana after a nearby lagoon. Based on what could be seen, it is believed that Valeriana would have been the second most densely populated Mayan city ever discovered. But perhaps the strangest part of this accidental discovery was the location. For the remains of such a large Mayan city to have gone undetected for so long, one might think that it was hidden deep in the jungle far from civilization. As it turns out, the city was just a 15-minute walk from a major Mexican highway. Since the discovery was only announced at the end of 2024, at the time of writing, the actual terrain remains unexplored and there are no pictures of the ancient city. Luke was planning to visit Valeriana. Ariana in the near future, though he admitted his work is more focused on remote sensing than on field excavations. Still, there will undoubtedly be many incredible discoveries once archaeologists finally explore the newly located city. Studying the inner workings of a living thing has always been a bit of a challenge. For centuries, the only real option was vivisection. More recent advancements have allowed us to use things like X-rays and MRIs to view inside a person without the need to cut them open. However, X-rays subject a person to radiation, and because of the use of strong magnets, there are lots of people for whom MRIs aren't a possibility. But what if there was a better way? It turns out the answer has been hiding in plain sight all along in the form of Cheeto dust. More specifically, it's the food coloring Yellow 5, also known as Tartrazine. Yellow 5, along with other food colorings like Yellow 6 and Red 40, they're very creative, has been an annoyance to the medical community for nearly a century thanks to unfounded claims of supposed negative effects on humans. But now it may be the key to a major medical breakthrough. The reason that our skin appears opaque rather than transparent is because it's made up of different components with different reflective indices. Two of the main components of skin are water and lipids, which refract lights in varying degrees. This means that as light attempts to pass through skin containing both, the varying angles of refraction produced by the water and the lipids cause the light to scatter. However, it has now been discovered that this process can be disrupted by applying tartrazine or similar light-absorbing molecules to the skin and letting it be absorbed by the water. Once the dye was absorbed into the water, its refractive index matched that of the surrounding lipids, particularly in the spectrum of red light. This allowed red light to pass through the skin, making it effectively transparent, even if everything beneath oh, was tinted a bit red. After applying tartrazine to the skin of lab mice and giving it a few minutes to absorb, the skin became transparent, allowing researchers to see the internal organs with the naked eye. Using high-resolution laser imaging, they were also able to see blood vessels within the brain when the dye was applied to the mouse's scalp. Best of all, there were no permanent effects on the mice. Within minutes of being rinsed off, the skin just went back to normal. If applied to humans, this could have all sorts of practical applications. And the most obvious one is that it could eliminate the need for some x-rays and CT scans as doctors would just be able to look inside a patient without radiation. It could also eliminate the need for some exploratory surgeries and biopsies for the same reason. And there are some less obvious applications as well, such as laser tattoo removal. By being able to see exactly where the pigment lies below the skin, this process could be done faster and more easily. It could also even be used to make it easier to draw blood from patients with difficult to find veins. While this discovery does have a lot of promise and will be useful in the research of mice, as far as implementation in humans goes, this is only a proof of concept so far. Human skin is 10 times thicker than mouse skin, which means that the time required for the dye to diffuse into the water of the skin would be considerably longer. Although tartrazine specifically may not be practical for making human skin transparent, researchers are looking into other light-absorbing molecules that might be more suitable for use in humans. 
The idea of quantum computers and the power that quantum computing may hold has been fascinating and confusing people for decades. But ever since the first quantum computer was built in 1998 using nuclear magnetic resonance, a technology which quickly became obsolete, the race was on for quantum supremacy. The goal of quantum supremacy was to do something on a programmable quantum computer that a classical computer would not be able to do in a reasonable amount of time. And from the beginning, it was a bit of a bizarre goal. On the surface, it sounds like quantum supremacy would be reached when quantum computers were orders of magnitude faster or better than classical computers, but the reality wasn't so simple. It didn't actually matter what the computers were doing or if it had any practical application. All that mattered was that a quantum computer could do it and a classical computer couldn't. As such, all experiments related to quantum supremacy involved algorithms that were specifically designed to be optimized for the way quantum computers operated despite having absolutely no practical use. In 2019, Google announced it had reached quantum supremacy with their new 50 qubit trip. These claims were immediately disputed by IBM, who believed their supercomputers could do the same thing in a reasonable amount of time and a short-lived feud resulted. A couple of years later, researchers out of China claimed to have reached quantum supremacy with their 74 qubit computer, though, again, these claims were disputed. And that brings us to December of 2024, when Google unveiled its new 105 qubit superconducting chip named Willow. It actually published the data back in August, but December is when the chip was officially given a name and a big marketing push. According to their research, the calculations Willow was able to perform in five minutes would have taken a classical computer three hundred million years to do if memory limitations weren't an issue, or ten septillion years if constrained by the amount of memory in the world's current most powerful supercomputers. While those numbers are believed to be accurate, they also demonstrate a potential issue with Google's claim. If the world's most powerful classical computer would take 10 septillion years to do the same thing that Willow had done, that means it would take 10 septillion years to check whether or not Willow actually did it right. And that's a big problem, because current qubit technology is notorious for being prone to errors. It's why quantum computers have to be kept close to absolute zero, as the fidelity of qubit gates is extremely fragile. That said, by examining portions of the data that can be reasonably checked by a classical computer and then extrapolating, it is believed that Willow's results are correct. They're still technically unverified and unverifiable, but there is reason to believe that they are accurate. Despite any of these qualifying statements to Google's claims, however, the development of Willow is still a major step forward for a couple of reasons. In 1998, quantum computers only had two qubits, so any increase to that number is a big deal. Google has doubled the number of qubits their chips had in only five years, putting them dozens of qubits ahead of competitors. Of course, it's been estimated that we would need a million qubits before quantum computers computers can perform practical applications, and uh, we are still about a million qubits short of that number. But, you know, every little helps. Far more important are Willow's improvements to error correction and coherence time. Qubits are short-lived, but by making them larger, Google managed to increase their coherence time fivefold. The end goal is to be able to store qubits indefinitely, and any improvement in that regard is a big deal. It's especially notable because making qubits larger was expected to decrease their coherence time, so these unexpected results could shape future research. They also increased the fidelity of the qubit gate from about 99.5% to anywhere from 99.7% to 99.85%, depending on which type of logic gate it was. That might not sound like a huge increase, and 99.85 seems pretty good. However, keep in mind that your typical computer can routinely perform billions of operations per second. If 15 of every thousand of those operations were done in correctly, that would mean upwards of 30 million errors per second. Obviously, that would be pretty terrible, and it's why increasing these numbers that sounded pretty good on the surface is so important. Although we're still a long ways from quantum computers becoming practically useful, Willow was several major steps forward in addressing multiple issues that quantum computing currently faces. There's still about a million more steps before the technology reaches what it needs to be, but perhaps the underlying principles used in the development of Willow can help accelerate the pace at which we are approaching that end goal. Thank you.